Hey, what's up, Sterling College? Hi. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Can I steal one of these? Yes. Yeah, you bought one of these real quick. Had a great drive in this morning. Wake up call, 5.30. But it's all worth it. It's all worth it. I'm not a coffee guy, so I'm up here on a straight adrenaline and faith. <laughs> Matter of fact, the first time and only time that I ever drank coffee was the first time I met my wife. Uh, she came down to visit a family that I was living with in Miami, Florida. And uh, man, right when I saw her, man, I knew she was the one. I mean, it was over with. I was lovesick. And I heard her talking to, uh, to, the, to the lady or one of the, the families that were living with. She's like, yeah, I'd love to get some coffee. Hey, let's go get some coffee. I'll take you to get some coffee. <laughs> and uh, my first time uh, ever getting it, and I remember taking a few sips, and she kind of saw the expression on my face, and she was like, well, what are you doing? Are you even like this? And, and uh, so that was my first and last time with coffee experience. I know a lot of you guys are on it right now because you've been studying hard. But, um, but I'm, up, I'm excited to be up here with a lot of faith and expectation to really see the Lord do some great things. And, and uh, I've been greeted by several of you who have been KU fans. And I appreciate uh, the love and the encouragement that you've shared. And yes, I've played on a lot of great teams, but the best team is my home team. Uh, I have a wonderful wife named Katie who will be married for six years uh, this July. Uh, we've got three kids, four, three, and two. And then we've got one on the way uh, here in June. So you guys saw those AT&T commercials, like with the bars? That's my life right now. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's certainly a lot of fun. And I absolutely love being a dad and a husband. Um, a lot of people used to say, hey, Wayne, you were made to play basketball. This is exactly what you're supposed to do. And, and I don't agree with that at all. Uh, but I absolutely love being a, 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 a husband uh, and a father. But um, Really appreciate uh, the choir. You guys did a great job uh, worshiping up there. Worshiping is one of my favorite things to do uh, by far. Uh, one of the things that I did this morning, driving down through Central Kansas on Highway 50, had the windows open, the praise and worship music on max. And uh, it's great to be able to know that our praise and our worship just isn't limited to a setting like this. You know, though it's great to be able to worship the Lord in a chapel service or a church service, but we have the opportunity to worship God in every single area of our life. Uh, the baseball team can worship the Lord by how hard and how unselfish they play. Many of you students, if you're getting ready to finish up the semester, you guys can worship the Lord by how hard you study and by doing things with excellence in your relationships and, and uh, in your jobs and your internships. And so make sure that we take uh, that worship experience and don't just limit it or box it up into a time during a chapel service where you get a chance to apply that to every single area of your life and that's something that, that I really, really uh, enjoy doing. And so as I had a chance to speak with Christian yesterday and just kind of get a feel for some of the things that you guys uh, have been talking about or kind of some themes that have been um, uh, um, resonating from the chapel services and just school this year. And he was telling me that it was about testifying or about being a witness and I really, really love that. Uh, to, to testify, to tell of the great things that the Lord has done in your life and on this campus. Uh, to be a witness, and really that's all preaching is, is being a witness to the goodness of God and to the might and to the glory of Jesus. And uh, even being an athlete, and I know that many of you out there are athletes, and just being in an American culture where we love to win, we love victory. I love how the Bible says in Romans or in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says that there's victory in our testimony. You know, it says that we'll defeat the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony and by not loving our life unto death. So we know that we've got victory in the blood of Jesus. Man, just celebrated that a few weeks ago, uh, Easter Sunday, when we know that there's 100% victory over sin, death, and the grave through the blood of Jesus. But I love in that second part, it says that there's victory in our testimonies. Man, as we share the great things that God has done in our life, and I'm really excited to share a brief portion of my testimony with you guys, but even as my wife and I uh, are campus missionaries who do campus ministry, uh, mainly at the University of Kansas, where we have the opportunity to travel uh, all across the country uh, to visit different campuses like this, whether it's a Christian school like Sterling or a secular school like uh, North Carolina or Mississippi State or anything like that, it's great to be able to share our testimonies in that very setting. And, um, and also, even remembering how it says in Psalms 107, it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
I mean, we can say so about a lot of things, whether it's about Kansas basketball, whether it's about cars, whether it's about pop culture, music, or hobbies. We can say so about a lot of things. But how much more should we say so? Should we proclaim the great things that God has done in our life by sharing our testimonies with one another? And it's one of the things that I enjoy doing, especially on the college campus, on the secular college campus, like the University of Kansas, where you've got so many things contending against the truth of God. You've got so many people, even professors, preaching against the Word of God and its truth and its validity. You've got uh, different people from all over the world. You've got Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists, and they want to say that, man, Jesus is not real and that the Bible is not true. And when you run into those types of people, they can argue about a lot of different things. But one thing that I've found over the years is anybody cannot argue. And it's not just for me, but it goes for you guys as well. It's your testimony. Man, they cannot argue you out of a transformed life. Man, they can argue about this book all you want to, but if God has done a work in your life and transformed you and made you into the image of Christ, they can't talk against that. They can't say that that didn't happen because deep down inside, if you've truly encountered Jesus, the only thing that's going to take place is a transformation. And you guys have a great opportunity to be able to share that, not just here on campus, but as you guys go home over the summer in your communities, you meet up with the friends that you uh, hang around with in high school and they see something that's different about your life, man, I encourage you guys to share your testimony. Man, to be a witness, to testify of the great things the Lord has done. Well, real briefly about my story, and I'm just going to be a brief testimony. And, and for those of you who, who came in with the hopes of hearing about, you know, grander stories about playing in the, the NCAA championship and Final Fours and different things like that, I'm, I'm going to disappoint you guys tonight. Because the only thing that I really have to offer anybody that's worth any value or significance is this word right here. I mean, that's the only thing that I truly have to offer you guys. And it's not an autograph, it's not a handshake, it's not a picture. I mean, those things are meaningless at the end of the day. But the things that I'm going to share and proclaim from this word of God, man, that's what's truly valuable. Not only for this life, but also for the life to come. So as a young boy, I grew up in Leavenworth, Kansas. I'm a Kansas kid. I love all things Kansas. A little small town in the northeast corner, tucked away. Grew up with great parents. Uh, they're getting ready to celebrate the 30th wedding anniversary uh, next week. Uh, factory workers of Hallmark Cars, Wayne Sr. and Margaret. Did a great job of showing me what a model family looks like. Uh, but really, faith in Christianity was something that was never really spoke about uh, in our household. Uh, it was sprinkled a little bit on holidays, we celebrated Christmas and Easter, but as far as talking about Jesus, talking about the things of God, that was something that we really didn't do. Uh, I remember being a young boy, having a heart to want to live for God, uh, but when I got to junior high and high school, I really felt like it was impossible uh, to be young and to live for God. And so I just began to live for two things in myself in basketball. And so really, if it didn't have anything to do with pleasing me or making me happy, as a young boy growing up in high school and even on to my earlier years in college, I really could care less about it. You know, if it didn't have anything to do with helping me excel in my basketball career or helping me reach my dreams in that realm, it really didn't matter to me. And I went on living that life and from the outside looking in, it looked like I was able to achieve a measure of success. But unfortunately, what people did know is what was going on inside my heart. Man, really feeling empty, feeling broken, feeling purposeless. And even the proverb in chapter 14, verse 12, it really testifies to the way that I was living at that time. And it says that there's a way that seems right to a man, but it only leads to his destruction. Man, the way that I was living at that time, the first 20 years of my life, I really felt like it was right. Man, it felt right in my flesh. It felt right because... My friends and my peers were telling me to go after and pursue those things. It felt right because I had people patting me on my back and encouraging me to live that way. But the, the fact of the matter was, it was really leading to my destruction. It was leading to my physical destruction because of the consequences of my actions. I was involved in drugs and alcohol and sex. And it was leading to my spiritual destruction because I did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I found myself at the end of my sophomore year at the University of Kansas. We've just gone to back-to-back -back Final Fours, back-to-back -back Big 12 championships. And I'm going back to my dorm room, night and night again, crying myself to sleep. Because again, this so-called world that had everything to offer me that I so-called had as a 20-year-old college student, 
man, it left me empty and broken. So I knew God was real, and I remember crying and asking God to show me something greater to live for than myself in basketball. And I remember falling asleep. A few days later, a few days later, I ran into a Christian at KU. I remember uh, it was just after class. I had a shoulder injury at the time, so I was in a sling, and I was sitting outside of my classroom waiting for the next class to start. And this guy came up to me. He came up and struck up a conversation and started asking me about my shoulder and my pride and my arrogance and my insecurity. I'm like, come on, man, you don't you don't read the paper? Like, everybody knows my, my shoulder's hurt. <laughs> and so the guy kind of blows me off, and I really liked it because he didn't pay that any attention. He didn't care who I was. And he asked if, I, if he could pray for my shoulder. And I said, yeah, you go ahead and do that. <laughs> kind of blowing him off because this is what had happened. That whole time that I was in my sling, probably about well over a dozen people had come up to me and said, hey, I'm going to pray for your shoulder. But to me, that was no more than just a basic courtesy because they didn't do it. Well, maybe there was a few that did it, maybe back on the walk or maybe back at their room. But there was something different about this guy. When he said that he was going to pray for me and I tried to blow him off, I turned my head and said, yeah, you go and do that. And I turned my head, hoping that he would leave. The next thing you know, I feel a hand come down on my shoulder. And this dude starts to pray for my shoulder. He starts to pray for my shoulder to be healed. Then class lets out. The beach is what's called floods with hundreds of students. And this guy keeps praying. Next thing I know, he's praying for my heart. He's praying for my family. He's praying for me to know Jesus. And I'm blown away by this guy's courage and his boldness to pray for me right then and there. And he didn't stop even when a lot of folks were coming around. And though my shoulder didn't get supernaturally healed right then and there, man, my heart was tender and open towards the Lord. And I can remember following that guy around like a puppy for the next two weeks. He began to tell me about Jesus. He began to share his life transform transforming testimony with me. And then he began to live out Man, this radical Christian life in an environment that's telling him to do everything but live for God. I'm looking at his life, and I'm looking at the Gospels, at this man Jesus, and I finally recognize, wow, this is something that's worth giving my life to. I ended up getting saved later on that summer, July 12, 2003. And it was incredible, the transformation that took place. Man, my life has never been the same. So much so that after I was done playing, came back. My wife and I went to the college campus to see that same type of thing take place in other young people's lives. So we started up a campus ministry. It's named Call to Greatness. We serve at KU and K-State. We're starting a little something down at, at uh, Baker University. And uh, it's great to be able to be on the college campus uh, where my life is transformed and, and helping those to be changed as well. And that's why I get so excited to be able to come to different college campuses and to be able to encounter students because that's where I was encountered by the Lord as well. And so, if you want to know a little bit more about Call to Greatness, our campus ministry, maybe you've got a friend or a family member that's going to one of these universities and you want to get them connected to a campus ministry, or maybe you want to find out different ways that you can help support us prayerfully or financially, uh, out there on that table, there are a few connection cards. You guys can just fill those out and we'll follow up with you personally or with one of those students that you refer to us. But we'd love to be able to connect with you or some of the other students uh, that, that might be attending those schools. Uh, but what I'm really excited to share about tonight is something that the Lord has really been touching me with about the last 18 months of my faith walk. I've been a Christian for about eight years. I've been in ministry for going on our fourth year. Um, but it's really been exciting what the Lord has really been doing uh, deep down inside my heart. And one of the things is kind of my holy discontent. Uh, a whole discontent, or I like to call my Popeye moment. Is anyone familiar with the, with the cartoon Popeye? You know, Popeye, you see him, he's this little old sailor man. The bully Bluto walks into town, he's wrecking shop, and then Popeye gets fed up. He's got his famous line, he says, that's all I can stand, and I can't stand anymore. He pops the spinach, and then he gets to work. <laughs> he gets to go work. And so everyone should have some type of holy discontent or a Popeye moment where they see something going on in the world, whether it's an injustice in the world, whether it's, uh, um, uh, whether it's bondage or brokenness in your family or in your own life or in your friend's life, and you look at that 
And you see, man, that's all I can stand. I can't stand anymore. I've got an answer for that because I've got the Spirit of God living inside of me. And you go and you bring the kingdom of God to that very area. Well, my holy discontent is basically Jesus. Man, I love to exalt Jesus Christ. And really, my discontent is when I look at the world and when I look at the culture and I see a latent accusation in so many people's heart in trying to marginalize Jesus Christ as merely a good teacher, merely a cultural icon, maybe just a man who had good character, a Christian mascot, maybe a variable in a formula to achieving salvation. And man, that really gets me going. Because that's not the Jesus that I encountered. That's not the Jesus that completely transformed my life. That's not the Jesus that wants to encounter each and every one of us here in this room in a beautiful, beautiful way. And so I want to contend against that very thing. And that's why I have such a heart to exalt Jesus in everywhere I can. Because the Jesus that I follow the Jesus that we're here to celebrate, the Jesus that we're here in the name of, the Jesus that many of you have experienced and encountered and have a beautiful relationship with, man, he's so much more than those things. Man, even thinking about the pre-existence of Jesus. And I love how in John chapter 1 it says that he was there in the beginning. Proverbs 8 says that he was a master craftsman at the side of God. The foundations of the world. John 17, man, I love it in Jesus' high priestly prayer. As he's praying for the disciples, he's praying for the world, he's strengthening himself because he's getting ready to go to the cross. And what does he reminisce on? It says that he reminisces on the glory that he shared with the Father before the world even began. I mean, think about that. Who else can say that? Sure, I can say, hey, I hit a couple of game winning shots. I'll maybe won a championship or two, but I tell you what, that is not anywhere compared to the glory that Jesus shared with the Father before the foundation of the world. Man, the Jesus that we follow, the Jesus that we're here to serve and to love. Man, I think about the Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 4, when he was at his weakest moment, fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, hungry, tired, weary. The enemy came and gave him his best shot. Man, what a coward he was to wait till Jesus was broken and hurt and weak to try to tempt him, but yet Jesus came out on the other side, victorious. Wow, what a great and powerful man. Man, I love to even think about the Jesus in John chapter 2, where he began his ministry, and he walked into the temple, and he saw the money changers taking advantage of people in the situation. It says that he formed a whip, he drove out the money changers, he flipped over tables. Man, but I really like it. It says when the disciples and the onlookers looked at him, they remembered Psalm 69, that the zeal of the Lord consumed him. It's like, wow, man, when people look at my faith, when people look at your faith, is that what they're going to see? Is that what they're going to recognize, man, that the zeal of the house of the Lord consumes you in every single way? Man, that's how I like to be looked at. That's how I like to be recognized. Man, I love it in Mark chapter 4. Man, see, but think about the power of Jesus' words, how he spoke to the storm. The waves dropped, the winds died down. On the very body of water that he would later walk on, the very body of water that he would later tell the disciples to cast their nets on the other side, they had a great catch of fish. So much so that it broke the net and almost saved the boat. Man, his sovereignty over creation. Man, this man Jesus, there's no one like him. Man, thinking about the story in John 13, the amazing humility that he possessed as God himself knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. Man, think about his humility. Think about his kindness that he even washed his enemy's feet. Judas washed his feet and then sat him at the place of honor at the last of us. Man, what kindness and what humility, what meekness that this man is showing us. Man, the very same types of characteristics and attributes that he desires for us to display. Man, I love in John 18, 
as the garrison of Roman, Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus, as he proclaimed the identity of who he was, he asked them, hey, who are you here looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And I love it how he says, he says, I am he. And as soon as he released that identity, it says that the ground quaked and those men fell down to the ground. Man, how powerful his identity is as the son of God. Man, later on he'd be taken to the Sanhedrin in the middle of the night to be falsely tried, kangaroo court, in secret, no one was there but those who wanted to rise up and to kill him. And as they were hurling accusations and insults and threats at him, man, he was secure enough in who he was that he didn't say a word, that he stood silent. Wow, I mean, think about how much up in arms you want to get when someone posts a rumor on Twitter or Facebook about us. We want to get up in arms. We want to defend ourselves. But yet, yeah, here it is. God himself remaining silent. And of course, we know on the holiday we just celebrated. Luke 23, Jesus Christ being brutally whipped and beaten. Man, for each and every one of us here. Being forced to carry his own cross. Being mocked and spat upon by the very ones that he created. Then hanging there on that cross. But of course, we know what took place later on after that. The greatest victory that's ever taken place. Jesus Christ defeating sin, death, and the grave. Rising again on the third day. Wow, what a man. What a man's man. And then you've been thinking about Revelation chapter 1. It talks about Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. I love how John encounters Jesus. And he gives these beautiful descriptions of what he's like. He's got hair that's white as snow. His skin is bronze like coming out of a furnace. His eyes are like blazing fire. It says that his voice is that of rushing waters, that he's holding seven stars in his hand, and there's a sword coming out of his mouth, and that his face is shining like the brilliance of the sun. Is that the type of Jesus that you think about? Is that the Jesus that you pray to? Is that the Jesus that you worship? Man, is this the man that we behold? Because I'm telling you, he is so much more than just a teacher, he's so much more than just a man of good character. He's so much more than just someone to identify the Christian faith with, he's God. And I love as we get a chance to behold him in all his glory, man, our response should be that of the disciple Thomas. He says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And so the question that I want to pose to you guys this morning is are you familiar with Jesus or are you fascinated by him? Are you familiar with Jesus or are you fascinated by him? Man, I can remember being in a situation not too long ago where I found myself familiar with Jesus. There's an old saying out there that says that familiarity breeds contempt. Basically saying when you get familiar with something, you no longer respect it. You no longer revere it. You no longer cherish it. I mean, we have an understanding of that just being young people, maybe growing up, had to have that toy, had to have that new electronic device. And then what happened? The allure started to wear off. You started to no longer play with it. And the next thing you know, it ends up at the bottom of the pipe. Well, you know what? A lot of times, that's how Jesus is found in our life. May we first encounter him, maybe when we were young, or maybe on the college campus, we're excited, we're fired up. But yet we become familiar with him. And I found myself just a few Christmases ago. This is how I found myself being familiar. It was January 2nd. I was cleaning up our Christmas decorations and my wife decided to put on some Christmas worship music. I'm boxing under the TV scene. She puts on the Christmas music. I said, hey, honey, turn that off. It's not Christmas anymore. And I can remember right there in that moment, 
man, a conviction of the Lord came upon me. And I felt the Lord speak to me. Wow. You need to tell me that me sending my son to earth, wrapping myself in flesh, coming as an infant baby, is not worthy of praise all the time. And I remember my heart broke. It broke. I can remember even a few nights before that as the Lord was convicting me for my familiarity with Jesus. I was reading my young kids some bedtime stories. And for the 23rd night in a row, they wanted me to read them the story of Zacchaeus, the little guy who climbed up in the tree. I think they like that story because Daddy's a big guy and they like stories about little guys. <laughs> daddy, 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 read us the story of Zacchaeus again. Oh, can we please move on to something else? But it was no laughing matter because in my heart I had become familiar with Jesus. Man, what might that look like for you? Maybe you come to a chapel, a church on Sunday morning. The pastor tells you to turn to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Sermon on the Mount. Oh, man, I've heard this before. Maybe you're getting ready to start worship Sunday morning or chapel. And they sing a song that maybe you've heard before. Wow, oh, man, not this one again. This one doesn't give me that fuzzy feeling inside. Man, you're familiar. Because it's not about the song that you're singing. It's about the one that you're singing to. And so there are many different ways that we can become familiar with Jesus. But I tell you what, he wants us to become fascinated with him. Man, in every single area of our life. Man, as we behold his life in the gospel. Man, he desires us to be fascinated with him so that might fuel our hearts to love him. That might fuel our ministry as we tell other people about him. And as I began to be convicted by this and focus my attention on the Gospels and on the face of Jesus Christ, I began to have two questions answered to me that I feel like are two questions that everyone asks themselves at some time in their life. And the questions are, who is God and what is he like? And we can find the answers to those questions in Jesus. Man, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Christ Jesus. Man, we even know the true claims of Jesus Christ where he says that when we have seen him, we have seen the Father. That he and the Father are one. So as we behold this man, our hearts can be undone. Our hearts can be fascinated. Man, we get a chance to behold who God is and what he's like. That's why the name of Jesus is so offensive and yet so potent. It's amazing college campuses, political avenues, the workplace. You can talk about God freely. But yet when you mention the name Jesus, something happens. Because everything becomes so clear of who God is and what he's like. And so I just really hope that you guys would guard your hearts, even as you attend a Christian school, as you're going to Bible studies and chapels and you're studying about it in class, man, don't find yourself in a place of familiarity with Jesus. Man, but find your place and find your heart being fascinated with everything about him. And as you do that, you'll be able to love more. As you do that, you'll be able to endure more. As you do that, you'll be able to minister to your peers. As you do that, you'll be able to take the kingdom of God into every sphere of life, into your vocation, into your family, into your relationships. And I'm going to finish up with one scripture because we've got to finish up here. And this is something that really opened my eyes and opened my heart to being refascinated with Jesus Christ. And this scripture verse has been wrecking me time and time again. Probably my favorite scripture verse in all the Bible is in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. It says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created in him and through him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, 
and through him will reconcile all things to himself, whether things in heaven or things in earth, making peace through his bloodshed, his bloodshed on the cross. Does that fascinate your heart? When you hear about this man, when you hear about his supremacy, when you hear about how the fullness of God dwells in this man, does that fascinate your heart? Or is it just another Bible passage? Now, I'm not sharing this with you to lay conviction or guilt or shame on your heart, but man, I really want to see the Spirit of God break that familiarity off the hearts of believers so they can enter into the full joy of all that God has for them. They can enter to the full purpose, the full destiny and calling that's found in Christ Jesus. So break that familiarity off your heart. Become fascinated with him. Even as John the Baptist said in John 1, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Man, behold him, look at him, set your gaze upon him. Because inherently what you behold with your eyes is what you're going to become like. Being a young boy, what was I doing? Watching basketball players over and over again, and then I would go and try to become like them on the basketball court. Man, that same principle applies to that of Jesus. Behold the man, Christ Jesus, and become more and more like him in every way. Be fascinated, not familiar, be fueled in your faith and hope in Jesus. Amen?